little bit about my work that I think fits in directly with the talk that you just heard, uh, dealing with cell types. Uh, but I want to start uh, by talking about behavior, uh, because in the end, that's what we'd like to, to get to. So my lab's interested in trying to understand synaptic mechanisms uh, of sensory perception. We'd like to get a causal and mechanistic understanding of just how very, very simple forms uh, of sensory perception arise. Uh, and I think as we're all familiar with, uh, sensory percepts uh, are generated internally in the brain. It's an active process. We usually go out, we seek uh, information through motor commands. So usually we sort of, as a first order approximation, decide the sensory information that flows into the brain. So there's sort of a, a motor component. And of course, internally, uh, we think that the neural cells uh, construct uh, 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 our sensory percepts. And presumably, that's through the interactions uh, of nerve cells, uh, uh, for example, here in the neocortex uh, that are talking to each other. So we're interested in trying to get to that level of detail where we might know what individual neurons and their synaptic connections uh, are, are contributing uh, 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 to the process of sensory perception. Uh, and I'm trying to see if I can get a cursor up here to show you. But uh, OK, there it is. But I don't see it on my screen, so it's not going to help. OK. So uh, vision, of course, is sort of the, 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 the situation that we're most familiar with in terms of sensory perception. Uh, but we're interested in looking at mice. Uh, uh, because we think that this is convenient in terms of having access to genetic tools. Uh, and uh, in particular, mice have one uh, whisker system that we think is quite useful that we think might be possible to get some sort of quantitative understanding of what's going, in, going on. So ...further processed here in the primary somatosensory cortex. Now, in addition to having sort of a feed-forward sensory pathway, there's also a very active uh, motor component. So there's an area of primary motor cortex, uh, vibrissum motor cortex, that projects down to uh, brainstem set and central pattern generators and drives movement of these whiskers. And it's actually, this is sort of the typical way in which the animal will gather sensory information. It will actively move these whiskers, touch objects, uh, uh, and that's how uh, uh, most of the sensory information uh, arrives. And so if we want to understand sensory perception here, or I would submit in any sensory system, we've got to take a lot of care to think about both motor and sensory components. And somehow we've got to try and put those two together. And presumably, that's how our brain generates uh, sensory percepts. So I want to sort of start off by just showing you movies of mice making use of their whiskers to gather information uh, uh, and make decisions. Uh, uh, and the task is a simple one. It's one that was uh, developed by Hudson and Masterton in 1986 for rats. Uh, uh, and we put it in the context of mice, where we have a mouse on an elevated platform. Uh, and what it needs to seek out is a target platform uh, where there's a reward. Uh, and the distance between its initial uh, platform and the target platform is so far that the only way it can detect that platform is through the use of its whiskers. So it needs to search out the space uh, around the end of the target platform uh, in order to discover the location uh, of its target. And then it needs to jump across uh, uh, and, and, and get reward. And the only thing that I want to show you about this uh, really are fast movies taken from above. So we're going to be looking down on the silhouette uh, uh, of, of, of the mouse as it explores its environment uh, from standing on one platform uh, and looking for its target. And so here's one situation. Here's the mouse on this initial platform. It's reaching across to this target platform, touches, 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 eventually builds up confidence where it is, and then makes a decision uh, 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 to jump. And so here, I think you can see that this is really a very active process. It's got its whiskers here. It's moving them. It's palpating this target platform and gradually trying to build up uh, the confidence uh, uh, where uh, uh, the target is. And so I think it's very clear that in this situation, uh, uh, we have a clear sensory motor interaction, very much that if you, with your hands, uh, or were walking in a dark room, you're searching around, you wave your arms around, uh, and presumably you start detecting objects uh, through that very active process. So what I'm going to tell you about are measurements that we've made here in the sensory cortex, but we think they relate uh, uh, to interactions between sensory motor areas. And we're sort of going to get to that uh, uh, gradually. Uh, and we're going to go, uh, uh, in fact, via GABAergic neurons, uh, uh, a subject that, of course, uh, Kawa uh, Gucci has, has, has uh, contributed to considerably. So if we zoom in on this area here of primary sensory uh, 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 cortex, uh, uh, in the so-called uh, mouse barrel cortex, where these whiskers uh, are represented, uh, as in all other sort of primary sensory areas, uh, we can, of course, see 
how the cells are lying through the thickness of the cortex from the surface appear, layer one, relatively scarce cells pass, layer two, a bit more cell dense, uh, layer three, layer four, where the inputs come in, uh, and here we have the deeper layers, layer five, uh, that we heard about in this beautiful talk uh, from Yasuo Kawaguchi. Now, within this area, of course, are many neurons, uh, and some of these neurons are GABAergic neurons, uh, uh, and that averages out to be somewhere between 10 and 20 percent uh, in a layer-specific manner. Uh, and what I'm actually going to focus on today, uh, uh, in a sense uh, uh, here, are these GABAergic neurons uh, that we're going to differentiate into different cell types uh, 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 and see how they contribute, perhaps, to sensory motor integration. So one of the nice features about using the mice are genetics, uh, and the genetics in the mouse have become quite powerful uh, in the sense that one can now define uh, uh, different types or these groups of cells through gene expression, through expression of Cre recombinase, for example, or green fluorescent protein, uh, as you see in this uh, mouse line here. This is from Tamamaki et al., uh, where they knocked in green fluorescent protein into the GAT67 gene locus and then turned every GABAergic neuron in the mouse brain green. Uh, uh, and that, of course, is very nice in terms of anatomical uh, uh, stains looking at the fixed mouse brain, uh, but it becomes much more powerful in the context of wake behaving uh, uh, animals, where here we have a head restrained mouse and we're looking inside the brain of a living animal uh, and we're focusing up and down. And these green blobs here, these are the GABAergic neurons uh, that are labeled in this GAT67 GFP mouse. Uh, and we've also introduced two recording electrodes uh, uh, that Luc Jonte has targeted to two nearby GABAergic neurons uh, in an awake head restrained uh, uh, mouse uh, uh, that's then been implanted, trained to sit calmly under head restraint. Uh, and you, as you can see, uh, uh, the brain remains relatively uh, 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 peaceful and doesn't move around too much. It moves sort of on this order of uh, tens of microns or maybe. Uh, five microns or so, depending a little bit on how active the mouse is. And it turns out that that type of movement artifact <clears throat> doesn't interfere dramatically uh, with the whole cell recording uh, technique that I want to show you, and that we have, we think, high quality membrane potential recordings from these neurons. Now, GABAergic neurons uh, are a device, uh, sort of a uh, diverse uh, set of neurons, uh, and this is also something that uh, Professor Kawaguchi uh, uh, has contributed considerably. Uh, I'm sort of uh, a person who quite likes to just have relatively sort of minor splits in the groupings of the GABAergic neurons. So some people will divide the GABAergic neurons into very many subtypes. Uh, I quite like the grouping uh, that came about by Gord Pichel and Bernardo Rudi uh, uh, a few years ago, where they divided the GABAergic neurons into the neocortex into three largely non-overlapping uh, uh, types. Uh, 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 and here, colored in red, in this thing here, uh, are somatostatin-expressing GABAergic neurons. Uh, in blue are parvalbumin expressing GABAergic neurons, uh, and in green are an other class of neurons, 5-HT3A receptor expressing neurons, a type of neuron that I'm later on going to be calling non-fast spiking GABAergic neurons. And if they label these through in situ hybridization uh, and compare with the total number of GABAergic neurons, they find that they can more or less account for all the sort of numbers of neurons uh, with very little overlap in this classification scheme. So we think that this is one uh, uh, that's interesting and appropriate, and also quantitatively, it just fits in well with the cell types uh, and cell numbers that we found uh, in primary somatosensory cortex of the awake behaving mouse. So in our recordings, then, we use a two-photo microscope. We see our green uh, uh, fluorescing uh, cells, uh, and we can use different types of genetically engineered mice to differentiate them. Uh, and we find the same cell types uh, uh, as Gord Fischel and Bernardo Rudi identified. So there are somatostatin-expressing neurons, fast-biking GABAergic neurons that express parvalbumin, non-fast-biking GABAergic neurons that don't express parvalbumin or somatostatin. And they fall into sort of roughly this uh, uh, subset, uh, uh, the sort of division of the GABAergic neurons inside layer two, three. So now we're specifically looking at the superficial layers of the neocortex, uh, uh, and we don't know so much about what happens in deeper layers. That's a sort of a, a major problem with the two photo microscopy, is that it skews us heavily to look at the surface of the brain, and we know much less about what's going on further down. So non fast biking GABAergic neurons, uh, which, if you look at the firing pattern, to me, sort of looks almost identical to an excitation neuron, uh, are basically indistinguishable in terms of electrophysiological characteristics. They have broad AP waveforms, firing patterns look very similar, and they actually account for about half of the GABAergic neurons in the superficial GABAergic layers. 
the cell types that we've heard, uh, I think most people focus on in terms of GABAergic neurons, palvalbumin expression, fast back in GABAergic neurons, that turns out to be just about a third of the GABAergic neurons in layer two free uh, neocortex. And today, I actually want to focus on the smallest class uh, of GABAergic neurons, the somatostatin expressing neurons that may just account for 20% or so of the GABAergic neurons in the superficial layers. So they have different firing patterns. Uh, uh, I think that's sort of uh, uh, obvious. They also have differences in terms of their just uh, standard uh, electrophysiological properties. The input resistance, for example, of the somatostatin cells is much higher uh, uh, than for the other types of neurons. Uh, consequently, they also have a much lower real base, so they're very sensitive to injection of small currents, uh, uh, and they will readily fire action potentials uh, 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 under many conditions. So this is sort of just the, the basic intrinsic properties of these neurons. The uh, nice thing, of course, about recording uh, in vivo is that there are spontaneous membrane potential fluctuations that may be relevant to the animal's behavior. So uh, in the first instance, we look and see what happens in the animal during what a state that we call quiet wakefulness, uh, uh, where the animal's not moving. We do high-speed video filming uh, of the animal, and in particular, we film the position of the whiskers. And when the whisker isn't moving, uh, then we call that uh, uh, quiet wakefulness. And during quiet wakefulness, there are slow membrane potential fluctuations in basically all types of neurons that we recorded from. So excitation neurons have large amplitude membrane potential fluctuations. So here's the scale bar, 20 millivolts one second. So these are slow changes in membrane potential. There are, of course, also fast changes in membrane potential, but there are these slow envelopes uh, that are uh, obvious in excitation neurons, in non-fast spiking GABAergic neurons, fast spiking GABAergic neurons. And the somatostatin cells are unusual. They seem to lack these slow oscillations, uh, or at least they're much smaller uh, than in any of the other cell types. Uh, and you can also see this if you look at the spectrograph here in the Fourier transform of the membrane potential. Uh, you see a large peak here for the fast spikers, non-fast spikers, and excitatory neurons. They have a lot of power here in the slow frequencies, and that's about halved in the somatostatin expressing GABAergic neurons. So the somatostatin neurons uh, seem to have unique membrane potential dynamics compared to all the other types of neurons that we've recorded in the superficial layers uh, of, of, of the neocortex. They're also the most depolarized neurons uh, of all the ones we've recorded from, more depolarized than the other GABAergic neurons that in themselves are much more depolarized than excitatory uh, uh, neurons. Uh, and both somatostatin and fast spiking GABAergic neurons, uh, and to a small extent, the non-fast spiking GABAergic neurons are firing spontaneously quite high rates of action potentials, uh, uh, which uh, is different from the excitation neurons, which are almost silent uh, under these conditions. They have a median spike rate of 0.1 hertz uh, uh, under conditions of quiet wakefulness. So that's all very well. We see the membrane potential of individual neurons uh, here. Of course, we would also like to relate that then to their neighbors. Uh, and so Luc Jonte, when he was in my lab, began doing double recordings uh, from nearby neurons, again, in the awake head-restrained mouse. Uh, and here, He's recording from two excitatory neurons, and you see again the slow membrane potential fluctuations that are characteristic of quiet wakefulness. And the gray neuron and the black neuron uh, uh, have almost identical subthreshold membrane potential fluctuations, but action potential firing turns out to be uncorrelated. So membrane potentials of all neurons, let's say as a first order pro approximation, all go together. So the whole neocortex under quiet wakefulness is swinging up and down by these huge changes in membrane potential. So again, 20 millivolts, these are massive swings in membrane potential, and all the excitation neurons uh, in the superficial layers are more or less doing the same thing. The same is also true of the GABAergic neurons. You take a fast spiker and you compare it to the excitatory uh, neuron recorded nearby, and you'll again see very high correlations uh, in membrane potential fluctuations between GABAergic neurons uh, and the glutamatergic uh, uh, pyramidal cells nearby. And you can do the same thing for non-fast spiking neurons. You can take fast spiking, non-fast spiking neurons. You can take any combination you want. Uh, and we always see high correlations uh, in these slow membrane potentials during quiet wakefulness. On the other hand, if you look at the somatostatin neurons, you see that things are a little bit different. First of all, of course, I told you that the actual slow membrane potential fluctuations are already much less in these uh, uh, neurons than in any of the others. Uh, uh, but uh, if one then looks more carefully and you start doing cross-correlations, you'll see that actually there's a small, weak anti-correlation with the hyperpolarization in somatostatin cells follows excitation in the other cell types. And so what we think is happening uh, uh, is that the GABAergic neurons uh, 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 will depolarize at the same time as the excitatory neurons, and probably they'll drive an inhibition uh, of the somatostatin neurons uh, uh, at the time where the other neurons are receiving excitation.
In addition, the somatostatin neurons might lack one of the important excitatory inputs that all the other cell types see. So all the other cell types, if it's an excitatory to an excitatory connection, excitatory to fast spiking, excitatory to non-fast spiking, single spike is very nicely translated to an excitatory postsynaptic potential. So there's a nice, uh, as it were, a high release probability of these synapses. On the other hand, uh, um, work in vitro work uh, 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 that's been done by a variety of labs, uh, uh, by Brad Sackman's laboratory, uh, uh, Barry Connor's laboratory, Henry Markram's laboratory, has shown that the excitatory synapse to the somatostatin neuron, uh, or the Martinotti cell, as it's also sometimes called, uh, 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 is a facilitating synapse. So a single spike may only give a very small EPSP. And so it could be that another reason uh, here uh, uh, for, as it were, seeing uh, no correlation, is that it also actually lacks the major excitatory input that all the other cells uh, are seeing around it. Uh, and in one particular example, Luke Jonte uh, was lucky enough to get a connected pair of neurons uh, in awake animals. So we think this is the first case of a synaptic connection studied in an awake uh, 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 mouse. So here's our excitatory neuron, here's a somatostatin neuron, and when current is injected into the excitatory neuron, Luke noticed that the somatostatin neuron would start firing action potentials uh, uh, by itself. And you could do this repeatedly. Uh, uh, and here you see that you can actually drive spiking rates in the somatostatin neurons to quite high uh, uh, firing rates. When you then hyperpolarized the somatostatin cell, you have to remember these are, are very excitable, these neurons. Uh, so you can easily hyperpolarize them with just small currents. So here injects 100 picoam pair, firing is blocked in the somatostatin cell. He continues injecting currents. Uh, into the excitatory neuron firing action potentials. And you'll see that these early action potentials, these first one, two, three, four action potentials, actually don't give rise to uh, an EPSP. It's only the fifth spike here that gives rise to this quite large uh, input. And presumably, as you keep going with these further uh, inputs, these are the ones that, in the end, were driving spikes uh, under the, the, the normal condition. And so I think it's entirely uh, uh, feasible to think that in many cases, one reason that the somatostatin cells are out of phase and out of sync with all the others is that actually they simply lack excitatory input because the firing rates in the excitatory neurons turns out to be very low. They fire median rates at 0.1 hertz. So it's very rare uh, to get a huge spike train like this from an excitatory neuron occurring. Uh, and so we think that's one reason uh, uh, that there may be uh, uh, this situation that you have an anti-correlation uh, uh, that's present in these somatostatin neurons, uh, different uh, from all the other neighbors that are highly correlated in their membrane potential fluctuations. So that's a little bit about the spontaneous activity of these neurons uh, uh, during uh, quiet wakefulness. Uh, but of course, we normally think that this is a primary sensory area. It should be involved in sensory processing. Uh, and so we're also interested to see what happens when the whiskers are deflected. And in this case, what we do is that as an experimenter, we take the whisker and we simply deflect it. We move it briefly for one millisecond. We give it a little jolt. Uh, uh, and this then activates the sensory pathway that I discussed. Uh, and we call this a passive uh, whisker stimulus in the sense that we deliver the stimulus. It's not the animal that's decided to get the information. We delivered it. Uh, so at this dotted line here, we have a small bit of piezo that gives us one millisecond deflection of the whisker, and all neurons basically depolarize. So an excitatory neuron will depolarize. Non-fast spikers, they depolarize. Fast spikers, they depolarize. The fast spikers are the ones that respond best in terms of getting action potential output. Then come uh, the non-fast spikers, and the excitatory neurons uh, uh, are fairly poor uh, in terms of the response probability. Many of them don't fire spikes. A few of them do, uh, and that then averages out uh, to giving you a small uh, a brief uh, amount of firing. Once again, the somatostatin neurons, uh, these uh, uh, potential Martinotti-like neurons, are unusual. You stimulate, and this is the only type of neuron that we found that hyperpolarizes in response to sensory stimulation. We've never seen this before. We've been recording for over a decade in, in this brain area, and we've never found neurons that hyperpolarize in response to sensory stimulation until we came to these somatostatin neurons. They also decrease firing rates, so they're spontaneously quite active, firing around 5 hertz. You stimulate, and they stop briefly for a, a, a brief period of time, uh, and they do this robustly. So somatostatin neurons are also unique in the sense that they're inhibited by sensory stimuli, quite different to all the other neurons that are excited and fire higher uh, uh, action potential firing rates. Finally, I started off by telling you that the main way that the mouse acquires sensory information is when it actively moves its whiskers to touch uh, uh, objects. And so the first thing one might want to look at is to see what happens when the animal's moving its whisker and not contacting an object, but at least it's an active process. So here we do high-speed video filming. We see what the animal's doing with its whisker. Here it's sitting still for long periods of time. This is this period of quiet wakefulness. 
and then every now and then it'll start moving its whiskers. It's interested somehow in its environment. There's a major change in brain state, and one thing that happens are the somatostatin neurons hyperpolarize, they turn off. The animal stops moving its whiskers, they start firing. A little bit of jitter around here in its, in its whisker, there's a little bit of hyperpolarization. Here, the animal's calm again, and their action potentials have been fired. Now we introduce an object, these gray bars here, so we put an object in the way, and so now when the animal's moving its whisker, it's actually touching something. Uh, this, I guess, is the situation where the animal normally gets its major impact. We know in excitatory neurons, fast spike neurons, uh, uh, and non-fast spikers, that active touch, as we call it, when the whisker contacts an object, induces a depolarizing sensory response. Here, there's no obvious sign uh, uh, of, of depolarization occurring. If you look here on sort of the average trace, you'll see that, in fact, there's a small hyperpolarization here also. At least the somatostatin neurons are clearly not getting interested in active touch. Once again, they turn off. And so somatostatin neurons seem to be unique uh, 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 and different from all the other nearby neurons. They hyperpolarize and they reduce action potential firing whenever anything interesting is going on in this brain area, whenever there's a sensory input, uh, whenever there's an active uh, bout of whisking, uh, or when the animal's actively touching something. So these are neurons that seem to turn off when there's something interesting going on in that brain area. Now, somatostatin neurons are interesting in the sense that they have an axonal projection that innovates layer one. Uh, and so whenever this, these somatostatin neurons are firing action potentials, they're releasing GABA onto these distal dendrites up here in layer one. And so you, we might imagine there could be interesting processes going on in the layer one dendrites when we turn off inhibition. If you turn off distal inhibition, you'd expect maybe that the distal dendrites might become more active. Uh, and so we had a look uh, using uh, genetically encoded calcium indicator, GCAM3. We express it in uh, uh, excitatory neurons. Uh, uh, and when the animal's sitting quiet, and we look at the layer one dendrites here, there's very little going on. When the animal moves its whiskers, we see dendrites lighting up. Nice de I don't know whether you can see the spines, but it does light up, and it lights up robustly. So apparently, as these somatostatin neurons turn off, as the animal's moving its whiskers, we release inhibition, and it looks like the distal dendrites uh, become more active uh, and start maybe firing uh, uh, calcium spikes or NMDA spikes. So there are many things that happen uh, in the circuits during whisking, uh, and so we wanted to have a more direct check also uh, on what's happening, uh, and so we applied uh, uh, optogenetics. We express uh, halo rhodopsin 3.0. We now also switch over to uh, a Cree driver mouse line uh, 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 from Taniguchi, uh, 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 and when we turn on the yellow light, this then hyperpolarizes the somatostatin cells, uh, and we can see a complete shutoff of action potential firing, so the optogenetics works nicely. And the interesting thing, of course, is to record in the nearby excitatory neurons, when you turn off the somatostatin cells, uh, the slow oscillations continue, no main change in brain state, but we do see that there's getting these uh, uh, multiple spike bursts uh, that we think are characteristic of distal dendritic input that turns out to be slow. Uh, and that could be then driving the calcium signals uh, 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 that we uh, uh, saw uh, previously. So the functional role, we think now, turning back to sort of the big picture where the animal's moving around, exploring its environment, there must be motor signals in motor cortex. Motor cortex sends profound projections to layer one of primary somatosensory cortex and also deeper layers, these somatostatin neurons look like they're well-placed to control this part of the input. They can decide whether this layer one input from motor cortex should be playing an interesting role or not. When the animal's actively exploring, somatostatin cells turn off, and they may then allow and gate this motor input into in prime somatosensory cortex, and that might then be a critical role in terms of establishing sensory motor integration. In other sensory cortices, it may be that these somatostatin neurons are involved in just regulating, in general, top-down feedback. We think of this M1 signal as a top-down signal, and many other brain areas receive top-down input into M1. And so it could be that somatostatin cells are playing a similar role in other brain areas. I want to finish here uh, by thanking Luc Jonte, who's the guy who did all the whole cell record recordings. Uh, Eve Kramer did the calcium imaging, Hiroki Taniguchi and Josh Wang from Cold Spring Harbor generated uh, the somatostatin iris cream ice, and Jochen Steiger helped us with the immunohistochemistry, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. We can, we can take a few short questions. Barry. I think you said something and then just kept on going and I, about the spikes, 
and you, it's clear that the, the membrane potentials are very correlated. Did I hear you correctly that the spikes are not? Yeah, so that's, that's absolutely okay. true. So uh, maybe just to specify quickly, excitatory to excitatory neuron, so spike rates are low, so it's not that we have really great data on this, but if we take the spike data that we have, uh, there's no correlation, it's just a flat line, the, the spike rates there. That's not true for the excitatory versus GABAergic neurons or GABAergic, GABAergic. Their spike rates are much higher and they more or less follow the envelope of these slow okay. membrane potential fluctuations. But for the excitatory neurons, the slow membrane potential is not enough, these slow fluctuations is not enough to bring it to spike threshold. So the, the excitatory neurons, they're hyperpolarized by about 10 millivolts, the slow oscillation has about the same amplitude, uh, and so they still need another 10 millivolts to hit spike threshold. Spike threshold is pretty much the same in all these cells. And so we think there's an additional thing that needs to come in to fire the excitatory neurons, okay. and it looks like they need an additional big 10 millivolt input to arrive. Okay. Any further question? Hmm. We are very much convinced. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>